It is now. I may, this may be the only one I'm going to record. Although some students are like, um, I really appreciate it having that extra resource or if they're sick or in quarantine or they're having a hard time falling asleep. You know. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please, off my plate. All right, um, so welcome back after the break. Hope you had a nice break. Uh, we're here for, what, 10 and a half weeks, gentlemen? Um, yeah, this is called school. Yeah, hello. You're in school. Okay, so I am recording this. I may not be doing so in the future because it sounds like, according to very valid sources, uh, got all of the juniors back, which is actually pretty, pretty darn good. Although, we're going to have to make sure, cover your noses, because uh, you're going to hear this from administration and teachers a lot. Uh, one of the considerations uh, in having everyone back is making sure that everyone is like uh, following uh, the proper mask procedure, covering up your noses, wearing it at all times. Um, I know, you know, as far as proximity, um, when you have your mask off, then you, you can breathe in stuff from somebody else's mouth. So that's one of the reasons, I've mentioned this before, uh, we don't allow for, uh, this is the admin rule, don't allow for food in the classes so you can eat lunch, okay? Um, I'll also be talking about, um, <laughs> wow. Um, you're going to hear this from Mrs. Rao during the second period. Some of you will get these lovely little uh, um, stickers, laminated Husky stickers, which is a pass to leave class at the end of second period. Um, by virtue of the fact that you have a C or higher in all of your classes. This was something that I became aware of yesterday. Uh, oh, let me explain. Okay. Yeah. So listen up. Yeah. Yeah, because I already figured out, it's like, well, that's a short list. Or, I mean, it could be longer. Uh, so Mrs. Rao's got one of these as well, and I don't know exactly what it is. Although I, I do know some people that at the end of second period, which is at 1055, for 15 minutes advisory, since you've got the quote-unquote longer lunch, some of you do, um, the first 15 minutes of the lunch period is advisory, and if you have one of these, if you've obtained one of these by virtue of the fact that you've got a passing grade in all of your classes, C or higher, then you can leave your second period class. Otherwise, for that 15 minutes, you stay in your second period class quietly going over, reflecting, figuring out what it is you need to do to get your grade up in whatever classes it's below a C in. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can get on your computers and so forth. That is, what <clears throat> that is what the teachers have been instructed to do in, in my class. The other half of the uh, 11th grade class, I think I've got like maybe six in there. And some of them, it's because they're actually there's only a couple of them are not getting a, a C or higher in my class. But I suspect because all it takes is a quick check uh, uh, on your um, power school grade to see what grade is and what it's at and so forth. Um, but yeah, you'll have to get that. Tomorrow? Um, if you didn't get a pass, if you can get your grade up in time, good luck with that. But um, you can get a pass from a teacher to go receive specific help from that teacher. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you have to do the 15 minutes in whatever second period class is. So I think the elective class tomorrow is, is that right? Yeah. So, so you're hanging out in my class, it's going to be pretty straightforward. We'll talk about the different things that you can do to improve your grade in my class. Now, keep in mind, obviously, as far as GPA, which is nice, um, all HL classes, English, history. Um, some of you, are you doing art for HL? Biology is an HL. Um, that gives you an extra grade point, although I think in the calculation of this, if you're getting a D in English or in biology or in history, that doesn't necessarily count for a C for the purposes of these little dealy bops here. But it does count for other purposes like, you know, colleges and scholarships when they're looking at the courses that you're taking and the, the various different, uh, you know, intensive levels and so forth that you're looking at. Um, that does matter. For here, if you were paying attention yesterday, I posted on Google Classroom an opportunity to make up some points because we just had the test in here. 
and uh, some of you guys did better than others. Um, and the retake opportunity to get up to 10% more is going to consist of doing the two essays that I just posted. This was uh, the essays for the at-home crew, because I didn't have them do the test at home for obvious reasons. They were doing, one student was doing the essays, although maybe, I don't know. Actually, I think you already did those. Um, so we'll have, if you do those, as soon as you get those in, great. Then we can get those posted into your grade, and that can start bumping it up. Okay? And you can do that regardless of whether you're getting an A, a B, a C, or anything lower. Does that make sense? I did post up here, because I've got that. As it turns out, before the break, I had exams in 11th, 10th. Ninth and twelfth grade, I had an exam like a you know a couple of weeks before that. I'm going to get the latest round of quiz retakes and so forth due by next Friday, so you can submit those electronically if you want, or you can print them out and give them to me. That would be fine if you want to get some more points that way. Otherwise, the main source of points for this class are the class participation. So come in here, take notes answer questions, ask questions, raise your hands, things like that, okay? Do what we do in here, which is history. If you have other stuff to do, because I know sometimes the temptation, it wasn't anybody in here, but the temptation sometimes is like, well, I've got a period before English. I can use that period to do my English work. I wouldn't recommend that, okay? Get your English work done before you come in here, you know? Because you have to go to English twice a week, All right? Yeah. Homework in my class, you guys know the drill. The homework in my class that will help you actually prepare for the test is don't wait till the last minute to go over all the material for the test. Because I don't think that works out very well for people. The homework is to review the material because there will be a lot of names. And the handout that I gave you already on the World War II packet that we're going to be getting into this right away, there's always a lot of names and details. You want to know those. You want to be really strong on those uh, for, the, uh, for the test on that. Other than that, we've got a couple quizzes for this unit. Can I hand it out this first one? That's going to come up on Tuesday. That's a 15 point uh, one, so come in prepared for that. And the IA. Um, some of you guys are in great shape. I've talked to most of you guys. There's still a lot of time to do things to uh, really make your IA awesome. The bar is raised a bit. Having said that, some of you guys did really well on the first go round. Um, if you did okay on the first go round, we've had a conversation and you've got a pretty clear idea of what it is you need to do to have that. That's a 100 point assignment. That's going to bode well for you if you take that very seriously for the grade for this semester. <clears throat> some of you guys, as I'm waiting on bits and pieces and I'll communicate with you guys because there's not as many. We've gotten through a lot, and I really appreciate your hard work on that, uh, especially considering we don't have huge, great resources here in this building. And I don't think that uh, Ms. Holiday is going to be able to organize like a BSU library trip, which is something that was able to be done, which was really helpful for extended essay as well as the history IA, but I just don't think that that's going to be available. But Google Scholar and um, JSTOR has been pretty good. And you guys have also found some pretty, pretty good resources as well. Um, let's see. Other than that, yeah, uh, some of you guys have availed yourself of some pretty good notes that were taken uh, by one of the staff, Mrs. Tucker, in the past. How many of you guys are aware of Mrs. Tucker's notes? Mrs. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, if, you, if you're aware of those, those are pretty good. So just you can tap into those. Um, it's kind of a nice way of going, oh, wow, Mrs. Tucker takes really good notes. She doesn't miss out on anything. And compare those to the notes that you took in class, and that might help you as you go forward on that. Questions? We've covered lots and lots of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, my gosh, there's so many different things. Um, I mentioned this as some of you guys were coming in way, way early. <clears throat> Don't necessarily expect to see you this early. You can hang out in the parking lot tomorrow because that's your spot. In fact... If you would do me the favor, um, when this goes around, just write your name in the box. I've got the number. You can see the number in the corner. And that will be my seating chart. Okay. I know Mrs. Anderson and the other admin have been spending a lot of time, a lot of meetings and so forth, trying to figure out how to make this work. 
so that students <coughs> have the opportunity to get the best education they have possible by being back in school because, um, you know, even though you kind of maybe like to sleep in a little bit every other day, perhaps, <coughs> yeah, what's probably best for your education is to be in school. I, I feel bad for students across the country who are in school districts who they haven't been able to go back. They've been relying entirely on online instruction. And for some kids, that's okay. For others, I feel for them. Having said that, here's the good news. I think I'm anticipating this, and you can tell me, wow, you were so wrong, Mr. Hansen. You didn't know what you were talking about. Um, I think next year when IB does the exams, I think they're going to take into consideration the whole COVID and quarantine, just as they have for this year. This year, seniors have an adjusted IB curriculum and exam schedule. I'm familiar with the history one. For example, instead of, you know, five essays and paper two, paper three combined, it's three essays. It's a reduced load, and actually that worked out, that's working out very well. I'm going to guess that that might be the same next year, because this year has impacted the junior and the IB program. All the IB classes, all of them, whether you do an IB diploma or just IB certificate component parts, they're all two-year courses, and the junior year has been impacted. I mean, in Britain, uh, uh, for example, they're still not sitting, they're still not going to sit down for the exams in May. We are here in America. We're, they're going to sit down for the exams. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll have kids sitting, you know, like you guys are, you know. Uh, but in Britain, no. It's, they're going to be relying just on predicted grades and then also their IAs. So the IA really does make a big, big difference. Um, yeah? Cross off Garen's name on number five, uh, number six, and write Garen in number eight. Garen, do you see number eight? Okay, this momentary uh, <laughs> correction. Yeah. So uh, at lunch, when you go to lunch. You can't be in the classrooms at lunch, except for advisory when you have to be, some of you, have to be in Mrs. Uh, Rao's class until 11.10. Today. You have to do it today. Yeah, I was telling Mrs. Rao on the way in about that, because that was something that we just found out about yesterday. Okay. Well, well, you're finding out now. I mean, so there we go. I've got my list of uh, your classmates who are going to get these little cool blue laminated things. If you lose them, you're good. They actually, there is an instruction because is it possible to contemplate that high school students might lose things? Well, yeah, adults lose things too. Oh, thank you. So, <clears throat> shh. Let's have a quiet, please. I haven't had to say that as much since beginning of the year. Oh, you guys be prepared. Yeah. Um, if you lose them, see Mr. Pettit, Mrs. Anderson. I'm sure they'll like give you a look and then they'll be like, you know, they'll check their roster, you know, Santa's good list, naughty list and so forth. And they'll provide another one for you. I don't know if it's going to cost anything more than like chastisement, but try to hang on to them. I mean, they're, they're plastic coated. How can you lose? No. This is your get out of the end of second period every day for a longer lunch thing. And if you fall behind, shh. If you fall behind, if you fall behind, I don't know how much it's going to cost you on the market. If you fall behind, um, it'll be revoked, right? So, I mean, if you're, in good, if you're in a good spot right now, great. If you're not, you can get one of these, but if you're in a good spot, you can have it taken away. I don't know how they're going to take it away, but anyway, the idea is to get students who are in uh, bad shape as far as grades back up to a better position, okay? And so use the advisory for that. I mean, they're using that in middle school and so forth, and yeah. <clears throat> At this point in high school, hopefully you guys have figured out some ways to uh, keep up with grades in spite of the fact that many of your classes have become much more challenging over time. Okay? Stick in your pods. When you go to Mrs. Rouse, I'm going to anticipate that you guys are going to be expected to sort of sit in the same spot, but if, if she allows you to do something different, then I'll, you know, work that. 
but, sh but when I came in yesterday and I'm like, okay, how am I going to set up my classroom? I looked in her room. She had three, six, six, and then she had some like semicircle things in the back. So, and <clears throat> Moreau's class has got to groups of three as well. I have no idea as far as the other ones, but good luck with that. Okay. Any questions? You lost your what? You haven't you've been given one in the first place. <laughs> Mrs. Rao will give you one. And when she gives you one, you better not lose it. OK? OK. Yeah, because you get one in your second period class. I'm doing her a favor by telling you about it ahead of time so that when you guys hear about it, you'll be like, OK. Yeah. No, no, it's for all your classes. So, <laughs> yeah, you have to have a clean slate to have that extra 15 minutes at lunch. But here's the deal. If, if my class is the only one you're getting below a C in, do the essays right away. I suppose. Take it up with your administration. All rise for the pledge. OK, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. I know. <laughs> it wasn't just coming from these, these guys. It was like all over. It was like stereo. That was cool. No, you haven't taken the test yet. You want to study. Make sure you study for that. You can always do that. And in fact, did we get everyone? And in fact, for the uh, quizzes, um, you can already you can already look at the um, retake opportunity for the quizzes. It's basically, and this is good preparation for the quiz anyway. Some of you guys do this already, and some some students do it. So I've got some seniors that do it, and they. Literally, before they take the quiz, they hand in two sentences on each of the different items. So that gets you, on this one, it would get you 1.5 points. So, and that's like, like on the top of everything. So if you want to do that, that's really, really easy. I've got ninth graders. Oh my gosh, they come in here and they're like, okay, we're doing the quizzes. And that's the, that's the way to make, let's just do it. So, Getting it done. Okay? All right. Other questions? Okay, go ahead and have your notes out. We're going, to we're going to get started on our World War II unit. Okay, so have a whole section dedicated to that. Um, I might need to print off another one or two. Okay. Talk about watching a movie, okay? Seriously? Yeah, of course. All right. Um, before we get into the notes on World War II, I'm going to give you this uh, permission slip, um, which literally I was in here. 
last one was it last year, I guess, uh, with the board, because they were meeting in here before COVID. They were meeting in here live. And I wanted specific permission for students to be able to watch Schindler's, Schindler's List. It's an R-rated movie, and the school's policy is not to have any R-rated movie. But I argued that there was an exception, that this was very, very valid as an instructional tool. And that's something that I'm going to keep in this unit on World War II. We'll get to it at the earliest in a couple of weeks, maybe more like three weeks or so, trying to get a, get a sense of a gauge of things. Um, so what I want you to do is, I'm going to go through and read this uh, for you. We've got, um, and literally, I mean, they took time in the board to like tweak this and, and get all the very specific things so that parents know exactly what is going on in this movie. Um, as far as the horrible stuff in history, I don't shy away from showing that to you guys. I mean, <clears throat> the Rape of Nanking documentary, that wasn't rated. <laughs> if it had been, I don't know. That was pretty intense. So, shh. Um, yeah, you can look through the, the first paragraph there. Um, okay, I'll wait until you guys are quiet. Okay. Quick question. It's, it's in there. We have anticipated all these things. Thank you very much, Carter. So, shh, we anticipate these things. So, very, very cool movie. Um, usually I have like 90, 95% of the students who, are, who choose to and get permission from parents to watch it. Um, and that's cool, because that's what we're going to be doing in class. And I haven't asked, but I think it'll probably be okay uh, I've got on here Mrs. Rao. In the past, she's had the one or two students hang out in her room um, during that class time period. Hopefully, that wouldn't create too much of a burden considering there's still some, there'll be a couple of empty desks and so forth in, in the back of the classroom there. Um, but yeah, we'll be watching it in here over the course of two, maybe three days. The alternative is a documentary because um, I want you to learn about Oscar Schindler, who made a lot of money off of the uh, slave labor of Jews. And his, some of his best friends were Nazis. And he, he bribed, he drank, he womanized. He was just, in many respects, just a horrible person. And yet, he had a heart. Some of you guys will know this, and it will come, up, come across very clearly in the movie, as well as the documentary, if you choose to do that route. Um, he had a heart, and he ended up taking great risk to save the lives of over a 1,000 Jews that were working for him. And it's a fascinating story. It's very powerful. It's very compelling. I remember the first time I watched it. This is before I was in education. So back in the days I was a lawyer. I remember watching it downtown at the Flicks, and uh, I felt like I got kicked in the gut walking out of there. It was very, very impactful. Steven Spielberg is a very good filmmaker using the creative abilities of techniques. Some people criticize, they're like, oh, it's all in black and white, but then they got this little girl going around in a, a red coat, and it's like, what's going on with that? And then when you find out, you're like, well, I'll spoil it for you, but it's an interesting sort of theatrical thing. Those of you guys who remember from ninth grade when I had you do your historical accuracy film critique and find out like what's true and not true about it, Spielberg's pretty good on this one. He sticks pretty close to the actual facts of this, I know some of you guys learned a little bit about the Holocaust in ninth grade, the boy in the striped pajamas, which is a, quite a bit further from like reality in the sense that if you're a little German kid, you're not going to be making friends across the fence with some little boy who is in a concentration camp. It doesn't happen that way, you know. Although it's still a very good <laughs> film and story, this, this, this is very powerful and I have no problem in keeping this in spite of... Uh, time challenges and the fact that you guys still are not in school 20% of the time, Mondays, right? We'll be able to get in a good, good position, World War II unit, and then we'll get as far as we can in the, uh, in the Cold War Part I uh, unit. So yeah, you can look on here. If, you, if some of you guys have read already, I mean, <laughs> I literally pulled this out of like a parent's guide to what you can expect in this thing. 
uh, you know, the F word, the S word, the BH word, the dang, you know, I mean, all those things at the bottom of paragraph two and so forth. There is one part, and I will black it out, sorry, um, it depicts, you know, so you're like, oh, what is this character? He's got such a lovely wife. What is that woman? Uh, oh, that. Anyway, so, yeah. So I black out this one little tiny, it's probably like about five seconds um, of the view of a, a woman naked in bed that he's messing around with, not his wife. Spoilers. Um, but as far as like other, other depictions of nudity in a Holocaust kind of sense, that's there. Just like you saw in the... Um, Rape of Nanking documentary video, which you guys held it together pretty well. I was, some of you guys were like, that wasn't as bad as I thought, and I think mostly because Mr. Hansen was like, watch out, watch out, watch out. Yeah, warning, 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 where if it's just like, oh, here's a video, watch it, and you're like, <gasps> uh, yeah, you got to get parent permission. So here's the deal, okay? Haley was anticipating this question, okay? Uh, see the part that it says, please complete this form and return it to Mr. Hansen by no later than uh, Thursday the 15th. Yeah, so that way I can get it in from everyone by that time and then I can harass people who haven't turned it in and find out exactly. And if, you're, and if, you, are, if you know, because there's always going to be a few, which is fine, if you know that you're not going to be watching it for whatever reasons, um, just, you know, fill it out as well and then turn that in, and then I'll make arrangements with Mrs. Rao. Hopefully it'll just be like maybe two or three at the most. Okay? How many of you guys probably anticipate you, you'll be watching it in here? Yeah, and I'll be watching it with you too. Okay? What's that? Yeah, that's my mom. <laughs> She's still alive. Yeah, I'll ask my mom. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, tuck that away. Very good. All right, let's get to it. Wow, World War II. <clears throat> Gosh, we haven't talked much about war in this class. Actually, it was kind of some of you guys are like, that's all we talk about in this class. War and genocide. You know, sometimes it's like they're overlapped. In this one, it's going to be a war and genocide situation. <clears throat> World War II is, because one of the things that happens, you can write this down. In war, write this down. Here we go. We're starting. In war, sometimes you have what is sometimes referred to as the clouds of war. All kinds of crazy stuff is going on. And what it creates is an opportunity for really bad stuff to take place. Considering Hitler, <clears throat> before World War II began in 1939, uh, Danton, was Hitler very nice to the uh, Jews in his country? Was he publicly sending a message to the world that Jews were being rounded up and exterminated. No, you can write that down. As much as Hitler was sort of like creating laws to separate Jews and make it illegal for them to, I don't know, practice any profession, get married or have any intimate relations with anyone who's not a Jew, um, attend public school. I mean, there's all kinds of things to just sort of make them, make Jews disappear. He wasn't publicly, officially killing Jews before World War II. After World War II began, and the foreign media, British, American, French, news media, and so forth in Germany, they were gone. <laughs> yeah, and they wanted to be gone. At that point, the clouds of war gave Hitler an opportunity to accomplish what he will write, what he will call as, you can write it down, the final solution. You'll hear this again later on when we get into the details of the Holocaust. The final solution was he had calculated with expert resources, and the Germans were really an advanced civilization and they could do all kinds of data calculation, that there were like 15 million Jews in, wait, 9 million Jews in Europe all together, and he wanted to have them all killed. And he actually got a lot of them killed. Anybody know how many Jews? Six million, yeah, give or take. Six million. He also ended up killing all kinds of other people that he referred to as being inferior. Carter, what would be a group of people that Hitler, besides the Jews, would look at as inferior? I'll give you two choices. British or Russian? Which would he view as inferior? 
wrong. Russian. Can anyone tell me? Raise your hand. Why would he view the Russians as inferior to the British? Yeah? Slavic people. All the people to the east, Slavic people, inferior. Okay? People more to the west, Germanic people, because the British, I mean, Anglo-Saxon, Angles were a German tribe. Saxons were a German tribe. They settled among the Danes and Celts and other people who were hanging out in Britain. They're all cool. One of the easier things to think of is if you got light skin or blue eyes or something like that, you're probably going to be cool uh, with Hitler. Blonde hair, he loves blonde hair. Yeah, okay. But Cadence, what other people in the world did Hitler look at? And he didn't, ha he didn't have an opportunity to get his clutches on them, but he viewed them also as inferior. How about Aborigines? Inferior. inferior. Native Americans? Uh, Asians? Africans? Yeah. yeah. What was his preferred race? Yeah, the Aryan race, yeah. And not just all white people. You have to be very specific about that. Yeah. So, in the clouds of war, you're going to see Hitler will take an opportunity to kill people he doesn't like. And honestly, sometimes you're mind-boggling because he would have the apparatus, write this down, he would have the apparatus of the state, as in like the railroads, and the allocation of the railway cars, he will have as a top priority at times for the movement of Jews into death camps for extermination as opposed to using those same railway cars to transport supplies and troops to the front line to fight the enemy. You're like, what was his priority? Killing Jews? Well, it was way, way up there. Okay? So this is going to be part of the story of World War II. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Because we've got a European war, which is going hot and heavy. And as we've already seen, um, no, what was the country that actually got the war started in Asia and the Pacific beginning in like 1937? that started it, that did the invading. Japan. Yeah, Japan. Yeah, Japan was already like invading in the process of killing all kinds of people that they thought were inferior and taking over in China and the Pacific. And so that's going to be going on as well. So we'll be focusing on that as well. There's a lot of stuff going on here. The United States is going to go from, oh, wow, we really don't want to get involved in any more wars to getting involved in a big way in both of those theaters of operation. And you can write this down, staying involved. That's going to be one of the themes as we finish up World War II is the United States is going to stay involved in the world. It's going to go right into the Cold War. Hitler, gone. But who's going to be our number one enemy? Garen, who do you suppose is going to be our number one enemy after World War II? Exactly, the Soviet Union. They've got a very, very different system of governance. Totalitarian system, lack of human rights, Oppression of people. Gosh, it's, it's so good the Soviet Union's gone. There's no countries in the world that are like that now. Are there? Really? Who? North Korea. Oh, that's running. But they're small. I mean, all they do is, like, fire off their latest weapons technology, which they have, because they wanted to prove to us that they've been working on their missile technology. And they're using, like, solid rocket fuel instead of liquid rocket fuel. Like, what difference does it make? It's solid, it's liquid, and so forth. It's more reliable if it's solid. And you could, like, fire it off to the United States. But this is North Korea. I mean, there's no other big countries that are, like, systematically rounding up masses of their population or certain groups of people in their population and treating them to all kinds of, like, slave labor and things like that. Where's your cotton from? Yeah, we used to do, get cotton from slave labor back <laughs> in the 1800s. Where does cotton come from now in China? Xinjiang province, yes, where you've got over a million people at least in, uh, anyway, but it's important to understand what's going on in the world. And so you can get a little bit of a sense of like, why was it that we won the Cold War defeating the Soviets and that we won World War II defeating Hitler? Was it because we just sort of looked around and said, Eh, somebody else will take care of it. It's not my problem. Well, guess what? The Soviets aren't your problem in this lifetime. The Nazis aren't your problem in this lifetime. Do you have problems in this lifetime that you have to deal with? 
well, maybe you should become informed on some of the techniques that have been used in the past on how to deal with those. It's not just a class for credit. <laughs> it's not just 90 minutes every Tuesday and Thursday. It's actually a little bit of something that hopefully you'll take with you and your communities for the rest of your life and maybe make your lives and other people's lives a little bit better. So let's see how this plays out, okay? What I want to do, in this packet we've got World War II, the nature of war, and we're going to be talking all about all the different technological developments and so forth going on there, um, and the tactics and air land and sea. What I want to do for you first is I want to take you through, and I want you to write this down, what is going to help for you. If you look at the third bullet point where it says air, land, and sea, I'm going to give you the names of some of the key battles, and I'm going to play through. We're going to use the map this time, and I'm going to play through in detail. This is very important that you have these details, because World War II is going to be much more fluid in Europe as well as in the Pacific. That's the first thing. I found this very helpful for you guys to, uh, for students to understand. See how it all plays out, and then we'll go back, and we'll look at questions like, wow, how is Germany able to defeat France so fast in World War II, whereas in World War I, they got stuck on the Western Front, the trenches. Remember trench warfare? Du -du 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 -du. You could in no man's land. Nobody could go anywhere. So we're going to see it play out visually, and then we're going to double back and look more specifically at some of the actual tactics. Because the answer to why did Germany beat France so quickly is going to be things like that, and things like that, and things like that, and things like that. Blitzkrieg, it sounds like a German word. Anybody know what Blitzkrieg means? Blitzen? It's like, oh, that's a reindeer. Isn't that like on Donner, on Blitzen? Isn't that so cute? You know what Donner and Blitzen means? Thunder and lightning. <laughs> Donner is thunder. Blitzen is lightning. Krieg is war. Hitler, comes, Hitler is going to use a tactic with tanks, artillery, and dive bombers called Blitzkrieg. It's very effective. If like you guys, I don't know, you guys want to be the Germans or do you want to be the French? <laughs> you want to be the Germans? Actually, I'm going to start at the beginning. The Poles are the Germans. We got to see where it all starts. The Poles are the Germans. You want to be the Poles? Cadence, what do you guys want to be? The Germans or the Poles? Okay, you be the Germans. All right, you guys lose. You got to be the Poles. So here you are. You're all lined up on the front lines, right? And you're like, we're going to get you, you stupid Germans. We know what you're up to. You're going to attack us. And you're not going to, because we're ready for you. Shh. We got our machine guns, and we got our, our rifles, and you come across, and you get in our sights, and you're dead. The Germans, they're going to use Blitzkrieg. And the Germans are going to use their dive bombers, and they're like, they're not going to hit all the parts of the line. Where should we hit? We want to have a breakthrough. We want to have a breakthrough. We want to punch through. Oh, right, I think she pointed it. Gavin, right in here. What's up? Here's what's up. You're like, oh, I got this part. It's so nice. I wonder what's going to happen. I'm here with my machine gun. So this is what's going to happen to you in the early stages. You and your soldiers right in here are going to get hit by German dive bombers. Boom, boom, boom. Do the Germans know how to use bombers? Yeah, I moved my poster back over here. Yeah, they did it, Ger Guernica. And, ooh, tanks. Oh, and artillery. We're going to hit right here. Boom, 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 boom. How's it feeling? <laughs> well, you might be pretty dead already. And then we're going to send the tanks in because the tanks are, like, so mobile. And they've got armor on them. And they've got really big guns. And we're going we're to send in a tank division right here. Boom, 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 boom. No. And so what you're going to have, if you can see on the picture, some of you guys are like, that looks like an interesting drawing. It's blitzkrieg tactics. It's using modern military war equipment in a very effective tactical way and punching a hole through the lines. And once you get through the lines, you turn around and you fire on the backside of these guys. And maybe they put up a fight. Either way, 
they're going to lose. They'll either be dead or they'll surrender. You can write that down. Blitzkrieg. Yeah. You don't hit all parts of the line, but you hit certain component parts of the line, and you weaken those parts. And the Germans will be the inventors of that. They didn't have it in World War I. They didn't have the dive bombers in World War I. They had stupid little planes. The tanks were not really quite there yet. Well, you can write this down. The Germans, when they do the tank things, they'll put them in tank divisions. If you see an armored tank division coming, you better be prepared for hell because you, you're not going to be able to defend it with a rifle or a machine gun. That's, that's Panzer and Tiger tanks. We're going to get to some of the names of some of the specific ones. And the Allies will have some decent ones, too. But, yeah, yeah, we'll make a lot of them, so which will help. And, of course, artillery, and we've had that from World War I, but if you concentrate the artillery on one spot, you can get a breakthrough. And that's been the way it has been in war for, like, thousands of years. You want to get a breakthrough so you can outflank your enemy, okay? So when we go and watch what happens in World War II, what you're going to see is, you can write this down and then you'll see it. I'll play it on the video. Thank you, Tiger Star, or whatever the guy's name was that put the, these little map videos together. This is actually, this uh, depiction right here is the peak of German um, victories in World War II. I want to say this is probably about 1942, 1943, okay? There's Germany and its ally, Italy. We've, well, those are going to be the main allies in Europe as, as far as like the Axis. Don't call them allies, sorry, Axis. And because we've actually, did we already identify those guys? As the, uh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, here we go. In fact, write this down. Germany, hello, and Italy are the two main ones. I'm trying to see who actually, actually joins in with them. I want to say, like, Romania, for some reason, they're like, oh, sure, yeah, we'll be on your side. Maybe it's hungry anyway, sorry. Um, and they will first put their attention on Poland. They attack Poland. Poland falls very quickly. You'll see the Soviets also cooperating. Write that down. You're going to see that as well. The battle for Poland. In fact, third bullet point. Battles of Poland. Germany comes in from the west. Soviets come in from the east. Poland falls within about a month or so. They'd already made that deal ahead of time. We talked about that before. Hitler and Stalin were like, hey, let's just cooperate. <laughs> we don't really trust you, but at least in this situation, we're going to trust you to take over Poland. Okay? And then, of course, you can write this down as well. The Soviets will attack the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. That's going to occur fairly early on in the war. And those three little new independent states are going to fall. You can write it down. Yeah, some of you guys might remember the fate of Estonia from last year when I did that unit. I mean, what could they do? Although, put this down, Finland. Woo. Finland became independent after World War I, used to be controlled by Russia. They put up a fight. And they're going to hold off the Soviets. Finland is going to be able to hold off the Soviets pretty darn well, which is going to give Hitler a little bit of confidence into thinking, wow, the Soviets really suck. If they can't beat the Finns, we might be able to take them. He was wrong about that. But it's fascinating because I remember visiting Finland like on some like Independence Day thing, <laughs> and they had in the downtown part of Helsinki, a tank, a World War II era tank that they got from a country that was helping them to fight against the Soviets. And guess what kind of emblems were on that tank? Swatzika emblems, exactly, because they got them from the Germans. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I like the Finns. Why were they friends with the Germans? <clears throat> yeah, because they had been attacked by the Soviet Union. Hello, who else was friends of, like, the Soviet Union? We were. Okay. After Poland falls, you can write this down. The attention is going to turn to Norway and Denmark. 
Hitler wants to get control and access to the Atlantic Ocean. And Britain is supposed to help out Norway in particular. Because Britain's got a navy. I mean, Germany's got to have to, like, I don't know. If they're going to attack Norway, they're going to have to get some boats over or some aircraft. I mean, how is aircraft going to help you? Raise your hand. You can, you can figure this out. Because this is going to be a new tactic in World War II. Some of you guys know this already. How can aircraft help you to get soldiers into a country that you're attacking? Parachutes. They're called paratroopers. Write that down. Paratroopers. And the Nazis are going to be very effective in the early stages of the war using paratroopers. They fly over in planes. Don't go too high. Don't go too low. You drop the men. Hope it's not too windy. You drop the men with light weaponry. And depending on what kind of uh, uh, enemies they're dealing with, they may be able to take it over. Poor Denmark. I mean, they're just going to get swamped. They wanted to play, oh, we're neutral. Hmm, too bad. Norway. Oh, we're neutral. We're going to see Norway and Denmark fall next to the Nazis. I'm telling you what you're going to be seeing there. And this is in 1940. Okay? Early 1940. And of course, everyone else is like, well, what should we be doing? Because France and Britain had declared war against Germany. Did they help Poland? No. Were they able to help uh, uh, Norway or Denmark? Not really. What are they thinking they're going to do? We can write this down. In France, they have built. I don't think I have that written down. I always forget to write that one down. They have built a defensive fortification called the Maginot Line. It's named after a French general, I believe. And basically what it is, is a heavily fortified, armored border fortress thing. It's like this massive defense barrier on the French-German border inside France, pointed at Germany. As in, Germany, if you really want to attack France this time, you're going to have to go through the Maginot Line. You don't have to be that much of a genius to figure out. If you're Hitler and you're like, hmm, do I want to attack France through the Maginot Line? No. Write it down. They don't attack France through the Maginot Line. Is there any other way to attack France except by going directly through France? I mean, this is from the World War I playbook. How did Germany attack France, Haley, in World War I? Directly? Who did they go through? Starts with a B. Yeah, I got that part. Uh-huh. Think of a waffle. Belgium. Very good. Belgium, yeah. Yeah, Belgium. And so it's like, I mean, for some stupid reason, France is like thinking, oh, well, the Germans violated Belgian neutrality in World War I. I'm sure they won't do that again. And it did. And of course, it's, it's fascinating because by the time the French figure this out and they're like, well, this Hitler guy, I don't know if he's really that trustworthy. They started to try and extend the Maginot Line all the way to the English Channel. They didn't finish in time. So what you're going to see next, write this down, 1940. Belgium is going to be attacked again. Oh, and this time the Dutch are not going to be left out. They're going to get attacked. Write this down. The Netherlands. Ooh, so much for neutrality there. I mean, did they really have to go through the Netherlands? No, but did they want to? Yes. Because then they got complete control of the Atlantic coast in Europe. They punched through into France. And in May of 1940, France will fall like that. And that's a shocker. Most of the British military, uh, soldiers and so forth, some of them are fighting in North Africa. You'll see that going on. But a lot of them are stuck in France. And they were about to be captured. You can write this down. It's called the Battle of Dunkirk, or the Evacuation of Dunkirk is probably a better. You can see it in the handout, Evacuation of Dunkirk. Dunkirk is a little teeny tiny. You really won't see this on the map so much. It's a little teeny tiny port facility. They've had a couple of good movies about it, one called Dunkirk. Um, and the British are able to evacuate almost all of their men back to Britain to fight another day. Were they able to do that with like big British uh, naval ships? Fishing boats, yeah. I mean, they basically call on the British population. Hey, you got a boat? Cross the English Channel, pick up a few guys. 
and bring them back. And they were able to pull that off. It was a victory in the midst of defeat. And then they're stuck. Hitler has accomplished his goals in the West. Write this down. You're going to see this because the critical date is going to be 1941. And it's going to be a little bit later than Hitler, and Hitler wants. Hitler is going to attack the Soviet Union in 1941. First, and you can't really see it on the map, but you can write this down. Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain. Are we going to see much movement as far as like armies? No. The Battle of Britain, which we'll talk about more, is going to be basically Germany trying to bomb Britain into quitting the war. Now, when I mean quitting, Hitler gives an option to the British. By that time, it's Winston Churchill as the wartime prime minister, the only person that the British can actually trust because he sized up Hitler as being a low-down son of a gun who was not trustworthy. The Germans gave Hit uh, Churchill, Britain, an option. Quit the war. We don't want to take over Britain. We don't want to take over your empire in other parts of, of the world. We just want you to quit. And the British say, no. So Hitler's like, well, I'm going to bomb you a bunch of times. And they did. But basically, at this point, Germany versus Britain. That's it. By the summer of 1940, it's just Germany versus Britain. Is Britain going to be able to push back and take over the areas that Germany had taken over? No, they're all alone. They don't quit the war, but they're not going to turn the tide either. They'll be fighting. You don't notice going to be some things going back and forth and so forth in North Africa. You can write that down. North Africa, you've got to push and pull. And part of the reason why it doesn't work out so well for the Germans, <coughs> we hinted at this before, who did the Germans put in charge of the Axis military operations in North Africa? Italy. And how does that work out? Not so good. Italy starts out at this base of operations in Libya and tries to attack the British in Egypt to take critical control of the Suez Canal. Seriously, write that down, the Suez Canal. It's been in the news. It's like, I didn't realize this, 15% of the world's trade goes through the Suez Canal. Have you seen that in the news lately? Well, it wasn't going through the Suez Canal for the last week or so. Why? Because there was a big ship, a big massive cargo ship that went kind of sideways. I think the wind kind of blew it in one bank, and it was stuck. It's called the Ever Given or something. I don't know what it was. And they finally got it loose. But, yeah, the Italians want to take that because that will cut off Britain from access through the Mediterranean Sea to its provinces in India and elsewhere. Write it down. Italy will fail. And then the Germans are like, oh, my gosh, seriously, do we have to do this? Write it down. Germany will like go, all right, step aside. We're going to get a really good tank commander. His name is Erwin Wommel. He's the Desert Fox. He'll be in charge of operations in North Africa. So you'll have the Germans and the British fighting each other there. That's where some of my relations are. In fact, my mom's sister's first husband was fighting in the British military in North Africa and was killed. It was very tragic. They actually, in order to, so that their forces were not seen by German aircraft, you had to turn the lights off, which is not really good if you've ever operated a motor vehicle when the lights are not operated. He got hit by a French truck driver because they were fighting with the assistance of the British and so forth in North Africa. So, yeah, so my, two of my cousins um, didn't get to know their father growing up. That was one of the things going on there. You can write this down. You're going to see Italy. Hitler's like, why did I put Italy in charge of anything? Sorry. I mean, the Germans are like really good at fighting wars. The Italians are not bad, but when they go into Yugoslavia, write this down. You're going to see early in 1941, Italy will attack Yugoslavia from its base in Albania and across the water. They will not do very well. Who's going to step in and finish the job? Germany. Germany will take over Yugoslavia. They will take over Greece. And all of that is a precursor to the number one goal of Hitler, attacking the Soviet Union and defeating the Soviet Union. Germany did it in World War I. Can't they do it again in World War II? No. What you're going to be seeing then 
1941, 42, is you'll see this massive push by the German military. And that is going to be most of the resources of the Germans. I mean, they're going to still bomb the British with aircraft and so forth. And they'll be fighting in North Africa. But most of the German military effort is going to be on the so-called Eastern Front or the Russian Front. And it is going to be tenacious, bloody, and deadly. I had a history professor explain World War II is really the war between Germany and Russia. Because most of the fighting, dying, killing is going to take place during a period in 1941 to 1945 on a vast front. This isn't like Napoleon going in in 1812 with one little army, big army, to Moscow and then retreating. This is a massive scale all along the whole front. Places like Leningrad, which the Germans will surround and starve a great deal of the population. Sucks to be in a trapped city. Moscow, they'll get, Germans will get right to the front. And then write this down, the Battle of Stalingrad. Write this down, 1943, Battle of Stalingrad. A city that Stalin named after himself. The Hitler's like, I gotta take Stalingrad because it's named after Stalin. I'm gonna take it. And Stalin's like, I'm not gonna lose it. Bloody, devastating fighting in Stalingrad. And it actually didn't matter quite a bit because if the Germans had taken Stalingrad, they would be able to cut off critical oil resources to the Soviet military. And the Germans failed. The Soviets won the Battle of Stalingrad. And that's where you're going to start seeing things pushing the other direction, beginning in 43 and in 44. Now, it's hard to tell. Write this down. Something else happened at the end of 1941. And it's ultimately going to have an impact on Europe. Evan, what happened on December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy? And it didn't happen on this map. It actually happened on this map. Yeah, the Japanese bombed at Pearl Harbor, the United States Naval Facilities in Pearl Harbor. This is where Hitler probably made one of his biggest, stupidest errors ever. Japan and the United States were at war. Japan and Germany are friends. Although, how much has Japan done in this part of the war? Nothing. They're busy off fighting China and doing other kinds of stuff. So, of course, the United States is at war with Japan. What did Hitler do? He declared war on the United States. What an idiot. No, I'm serious. Were we about to declare war on Germany after we got bombed by the Japanese? Uh, no. <laughs> no. But if Germany is going to declare a war, all right, let's bring it. The biggest industrial country in the world, are we able to put together a fight on two fronts in the Pacific against Japan as well as in Europe? Look for this. When we play the map uh, going through, look for this. The first place you're going to start to see the United States involvement is in North Africa. And you'll see it's going to take a while. <laughs> the Soviets are like, help us, help us. But it takes time to organize a country for war. You're literally not going to see the influence of U.S. military, I want to say until late 42, maybe even into 43, in North Africa. We're going to land in North Africa, Casablanca and the area around there. And we're going to, along with the British coming from the east, the Americans from the west, we'll drive the Germans out of North Africa. That's what you'll see. And then we're going to turn our attention to, <laughs> write it down, Italy. We're going to go after Italy. Uh-huh. We're going to take Sicily, we're going to take Rome, and then we're going to get stuck. Because if you've ever been to Italy, it's got a lot of mountains, and mountains are much more easy to defend. And by the way, if, even if you take all the Italian mountains, and you're like, well, I'm just going to take all the Italian mountains and push up right directly up into Germany. Um, there's a neutral country there, but there's also like a whole bunch of geographic features that make it really difficult to push up from Italy into Germany. It's called mountains. They're really big. Not those ones, but they're really big. So what you're going to look for next? D-Day. Write it down. D-Day. June 6th, 1944. This is a day that Stalin's like, oh my gosh, please, America, Britain, help me out. 
Do you know who's doing all the fighting and dying against the German army? Uh, us! Could you open up a front on the western side? Well, that's not easy to do because if you look, 